From the FJC in Washington, D.C., I'm Mark Sherman, and this is Off Paper. Today, I talk with Dr. Marie Garcia, a senior social science analyst at the National Institute of Justice, which is the research arm of the U.S. Department of Justice. She's the co-author of All Hands on Deck, toward a reentry-centered vision for federal probation, which appeared in the December 2020 issue of Federal Probation Journal. If you've listened to episode 21 of Off Paper, then you've already heard some of what Dr. Garcia has to say, because we included excerpts from today's episode in that one, which is a much broader discussion of reentry in probation and pretrial services practice. So this is sort of a bonus episode where Dr. Garcia and I take a deep dive into the research on reentry that she's been involved with for a number of years. Those of you who are research nerds will find today's discussion to be particularly interesting. Here it is. So Dr. Marie Garcia of the U.S. Department of Justice's National Institute of Justice, welcome to Off Paper. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. You know, in the All Hands on Deck article that you co-authored with Jay Wetzel and Scott Anders in Federal Probation Journal, you begin by discussing a literature review on reentry that NIJ conducted, and in the article, you break down the literature review's findings by domain. Those domains consist of relationships, health, employment, education, housing, substance use, and technology. So, Based on the research NIJ has done, what seems to work best in facilitating successful reentry in each of those domains? That is the big question um, for NIJ and I think the field in general. Um, as the, the lit review suggests, you know, we we know a lot about what works in reentry, as as you mentioned with the domains. We want to make sure individuals who come out of custody and back into the community are healthy, um, both with regard to their mental health and their physical health. Um, we want to make sure that they are safe, they have housing, that they're not food insecure, that they have social support, whether that be with their families or with you know local providers who can you know provide support with them when to them as they return to the community. Um, but what we really know is that we need a very all around, well-rounded, holistic approach to reentry. It's not just one thing that is challenging for someone who's been in custody for however long they've been there, who's returning to the community. You know, it's not just not having a GED or not having a job. It's usually a combination of factors. So we really need to dig deep and understand what those are and what those risks and needs is, I'm sure we'll talk about later. Um, but more importantly, we've learned a lot about the warm handoff to the community. Um, when you have someone who's been removed from the community for some time, again, regardless of how long that might be, you know, a lot has changed when they return and they may not ret be returning to their community that they're familiar with. So it's really important to have not just the warm handoff to individuals who can support them in the community, but we need that in reach while they're in custody. So we need local providers to come into custody, whether it be a jail or a prison and say, you know, we're here to help you and here's what we can provide you when you when you release and here's my number, you can contact me when you when you get out and we can provide services for you. So we know that those two things really, really matter for individuals who want to be successful. But the long term success is really, really challenging and we're still learning a lot um, about that particular process. So lots to learn. So NIJ is hard at work on this issue. So talk a little bit about some of the research NIJ has done, particularly interested in the areas you discussed in the article, the Serious and Violent Offender Reentry Initiative, the Second Chance Act research, understanding that the, the research that you conduct at NIJ is exclusively focused on state and local systems reentry. There are still lessons for us in the federal system, of course, because at the end of the day, reentry is reentry. People coming out of the BOP are similar to others coming out of state and local jails and prisons. People are people. So uh, I'm very interested to hear about the findings from those studies and what you think the implications are for the federal system. For a lot of jurisdictions, um, just to back up, for many years, you know, decades, a decade, two decades ago, did not have a reentry framework. I mean, they knew they had probation and they had parole, but it wasn't necessarily a reentry framework for a jurisdiction. So with Savori, 
which is a serious and violent offender reentry initiative, the federal government provided millions, I think upwards of $100 million in federal funding to provide support to jurisdictions who wanted to build up a framework. And what we learned very early on is that that's hard to do. You know, even with all the research that we have now, it's still very hard for jurisdictions to do, especially at the county level when you have, you know, elections and sheriffs and everything that changes every few years. You know, their their framework might be different from the one that you've had in place. And we know that at the federal level that that changes when we have, you know, new people in the White House and at the department level. So we know things change all the time. That is consistent. Um, so Savori so really showed us that, you know, a lot, there was a lot of interest in the United States for developing this process of reentry. And what does that look like for each jurisdiction? And as you know, you know, depending, you know, geography matters. So here in Washington, D.C., we have, you know, public transportation and we have a lot of social services, but in a lot of rural areas, they may not have that. So, you know, the jurisdictional needs vary by you know where you live so that really matters as well um, what we learned really interestingly in Savori was that when when individuals who were returning to the community were asked you know what are your needs what do you what do you think will help you be successful um, there was a huge disconnect between what they thought they needed and what they actually needed because we often think well I need to get a GED and that's very important and I need a job and I need a house but you actually need to be employable you need to get your mental health in order. You need to understand, you know, what it, how to interview for a job. And you need to understand what it means to show up on time and how to use public transportation to get to your job. So it's not just about having the job. It's about showing up and being employable. So th that disconnect between what people thought they needed and what they actually needed was really quite interesting. Um, and Savori was just a very large evaluation um, lots of money in the U.S. to support this effort, but it was really one of the first. Um, so what we now have with Second Chance, which has now been reauthorized for the second time um, under the First Step Act in 2018, is we have a more focused approach to reentry. You know, the department is now requiring jurisdictions to have a very, you know, delineated, very specific approach to how they're addressing reentry challenges. Um, and our colleagues at the Bureau of Justice Assistance are doing a lot of great work in this space in terms of you know allowing jurisdictions to plan and to understand what their real challenges are because reentry is different for everyone. Um, so we're learning a lot about um, not just what people need, but what the places they return to need because they need resources as well. It's not just the person. So we're learning a lot. And it, again, to my earlier point about holistic, the holistic approach to reentry, it's not just the person, it's the place, you know, because people are returning to their communities and to their families, and they often need support as well. In the last few years, NIJ has spent upwards of about $20 million um, to specifically look at innovative programs in reentry. And so what we're looking at is, you know, what's helping people and you know, when they return is that virtual reality, you know, learning how to do a job interview with the technology. Is it having, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing, like what's working? Um, because what we're finding is that, as you know, we have experiments going on in reentry and corrections across the United States and in the federal system. And no one's doing anything alike because they each have their unique challenges. So what we're trying to uncover is, is there a gem? Is there this program that works really, really well in, a, in one place that we can kind of scope it so that other places can try it out as well? So we're really trying to move away from um, doing smaller projects to more large scale. Let's try to build these up so that other places know like, hey, this works for us. And if you look like us, maybe this will work for you too. So we're spending a lot of our effort in that space right now. You know, one of the things that we always talk about in the federal system is sort of that the ultimate goal, which is recidivism reduction. And in both of the studies, the Second Chance study and the Savori study, there really was no significant impact on recidivism or even rearrest. On the other hand, there were some fairly positive 
findings when it came to individual services. And some of the things that we are really focusing on in terms of practice in the federal system, such as taking cognitive behavioral approaches through core correctional practices. But I think people may get hung up on the lack of impact on recidivism rates, especially among moderate and higher risk people. Uh, And I'm wondering what your reactions are to that. So I think that's a fair criticism. Um, but I think when you when you when you pull it back a little bit and you look at the research itself, um, just to focus on the second chance evaluations that were completed by SPR and RTI, together there were 14 sites, and to date there have been hundreds of second chance act sites that have been supported by BJA. If we were able to support larger evaluations, we may have found some different findings. One of the things that we're really interested in is redefining what success means. When we talk about recidivism, it's easy to measure, right? We can get data and say, were you arrested or not? Did you go back to custody or not? But when we really dig deep and try to understand the experience of reentry, you know, did you have housing? You know, were you able to get a, you know, an above the board job? You know, were you able to meet all of your, you know, Tech, you know your supervision requirements for the month, or did you not have? Did you have a dirty UA this month or not? Let's look at recidivism, of course, because that's the that's what we all want to know about. But we also want to know, you know, were their needs met? You know, were they able to secure housing and, and employment? So we want to really challenge the field to redefine, you know, success when it comes to reentry. It sounds to me like the idea is to focus on sort of the smaller wins right? Especially if we're talking about moderate to higher risk people coming out of the Bureau of Prisons through the residential reentry centers and then back into the community onto post-conviction supervision. I mean, that's, as we know, an extraordinarily difficult path to navigate. Sort of makes sense that you would want to look at some of the quote unquote, baby steps or the small victories that a person re-entering needs to obtain before you can get to sort of the ultimate outcome, which is no rearrest and no recidivism. We talked for very briefly, and I would like to go back to it, about these various domains, right? Relationships, health, employment, education, housing, substance use. Are there things that you are observing in the work that you've done on reentry, where you feel like, and kind of going back to the what you had said at the beginning of the conversation, are there things that you are seeing that give you hope and are areas where practitioners really should spend some time focusing? So I'll start my response with just a bit of a personal anecdote. Um, prior to you know where I am now in, in my career, I worked in a female prison in California. And I worked there for a few years. And during my time, I saw women cycle in and out. You know, they'd come to custody for a few months and, you know, for a technical violation. And then they leave and go out into the community for three or four months. And then they come right back. As someone who really wasn't, you know, really well read on the field, I wasn't sure, like, why are you coming back here? Like, wouldn't you want to stay out? Like, wouldn't you, you know? And then they would tell me, I don't have a family that supports me. I come to prison to get clean. So my I don't I don't know how to survive out there. I don't know what it takes. So I think we need the small wins because as we know with the recidivism rate as high as it is, a lot of people aren't going to get it right the first time or the second time or even the third time. What we're seeing in some of the work that we're we're doing at NIJ is our researchers are really taking to heart this this notion of, you know, we see the numbers, we see how high they are. So we can't really just focus on rearrest. Like we really have to open our minds about what this really means in terms of what we're, how we understand this process. Um, and because we know not everything works for the same person at the same point in their life. So then how can this one metric be the only thing that we focus on? So I think with practitioners, um, you know, in the last maybe 30 or 40 years, and Mark, you can correct me on this, um, We've really seen a shift from, you know, just locking people up for technical violations, but now we're seeing, well, 
I see you didn't go to your, your meetings this week with your counselor. You know, what's going on with you? Do you need more help? Do you need more assistance? Are you taking your meds? You know, so we're seeing this very humanistic approach to the process. And I think practitioners, when I've, you know, gone to conferences and I talk to colleagues in the field, they're really, you know, I, they say, I don't want to lock anyone up. I don't want to send anyone back because I know that they're trying really, really hard. So I think what we're seeing is that not only is the research growing in a way that's really wonderful, but we're also seeing that in the field. You know, we're seeing, um, you know, practitioners understand that like, yeah, a dirty UA is an indicative of they're going down the wrong path. You know, maybe they had a slip, maybe they had a fight with a loved one, maybe they had a bad day, maybe they got fired from their new job or something like that. Like it's not always indicative of something's going wrong with this person because prison may not correct it. You know, a 30 day stint in jail may not be the right decision. So I, I think practitioners are really hearing the field and they're, you know, they're really, and they're driving it as well because they're saying to researchers, we can't lock everybody up, especially now with COVID. We can't arrest everyone and put them in jail. You know, we, we can't do that anymore. What what was working isn't working. We have to do something different. Um, and if COVID has taught us anything, it's just we have to be able to pivot when things like that happen. And I think the field has done a really good job in doing that. Um, so I think everyone is changing. The research that we're doing is changing. The practitioners who are doing this work are changing. And I think that's a really positive sign. After a short break, we're going to talk about how pretrial fits into this idea of a holistic approach to reentry. This is Off Paper. Hi, I'm Lori Murphy, a colleague of Mark Sherman and head of the Executive Education Group at the FJC. We have a podcast that focuses on leadership in the federal courts called In Session, Leading the Judiciary, that I think you'll like. Each episode features current research and cutting edge insights into leadership. Guests include Michael Lewis, groundbreaking author of The Undoing Project and Moneyball, Professor Jennifer Eberhardt, implicit bias researcher at Stanford University, and Harvard Business School's expert on psychological safety, Amy Edmondson. Each episode strives to enhance listeners' critical thinking skills, encourage expression of authentic leadership, and promote the use of best practices among judiciary executives. Episodes are available wherever you get your podcasts or on fjc.dcn. Join us. The podcast is In Session, Leading the Judiciary. I wanted to ask you, Marie, within the article, there are references to U.S. probation and pretrial services. So I wanted to ask you, thinking about this idea of a holistic approach, do you have any thoughts about the role of pretrial in reentry? What we're seeing, at least from the literature that I've read, is that pretrial phase is really critical to someone's success. And I understand, you know, the pretrial phase is like that you don't want the failures to appear. You want someone to actually go through the process and, and see their way through it all. But, you know, when you what we do know, I think when we talk about removing someone from the community and, you know, with jails and prisons, you could even just remove them for a week and that can completely upend their life. They could lose a job. They could lose their housing. If it's temporary, you know, there's a lot that can happen. So perhaps we use our risk and needs assessment tools. Perhaps we use our, you know, our knowledge about this person. Um, because what we do know is that someone who goes to prison has typically been arrested on average about 12 times. So this this is not, you know, I did something once and I got arrested and I went to prison. This is, I've got a history of doing this time and again. So perhaps, you know, we don't take that measure so quickly. Perhaps we just kind of look at the person and try to understand what's going on with them. So I think pretrial is hugely important because as you know, Mark, you know, corrections, and I'm speaking specifically about, you know, BOP and state level custody, that's a back end response to a front end decision. You know, you can't control who you get in prison, what issues they bring with them, what challenges they have, or how, how long they stay. You've got to deal with who you have and you do the best that you can. So it's really those front end decisions like arrest and pretrial emotions that really, I think, determine what happens over the course of this person's, you know, time in the system. So I think it's critical that that phase is incredibly, incredibly important. And I think, like, I think like a lot of researchers, I would say we need more research. We need to know a lot more about that impact and what that means down the road. And I think that's, 
I'm going to have to write and make a note about that. Like, bring this up. Let's do this. So I, I think that's incredibly important. So Marie, you mentioned risk assessments. What are your thoughts about the use of sophisticated risk needs instruments? We use them now in the U.S. probation and pretrial system. I know there has been a risk needs instrument developed by the Bureau of Prisons. Very interested to hear your thoughts as a researcher, how we should be thinking about that and practitioners should be thinking about that when it comes to facilitating reentry. I think everyone is using, you know, machine learning and kind of AI and big data kind of to figure out, you know, what's what's best for most people. It's really interesting the, how the field has developed over time um, because a lot of jurisdictions I know want to move in that direction, but they don't actually have the data and the infrastructure to allow them to do that. As you mentioned, you know, the the, the tool that's being used with the Bureau of Prisons, you know, that's statutorily required. You know, we're talking about different populations, you know, federal, state, and local, but we still know, you know, criminal history matters. We know age at first arrest matters. You know, we know, you know, infraction-free times when you're in custody, like that stuff matters. And in prisons, it really drives what types of programming and services that they, re- they receive while they're in custody. Um, so I think it's it's just a critical way of, of making decisions and making sure, you know, individuals get the right treatment they need at the right time. So I, I, I think it's a really exciting, it, it, it's a really exciting time in the field right now. So our audience, primarily U.S. probation and pre-child services officers, obviously are quite familiar with the risk assessment tools they use, the, the pre-child risk assessment instrument and the post-conviction risk assessment instrument. But perhaps they're, they're less familiar with the, the relatively new risk and needs assessment that's used by the Bureau of Prisons, which is the Prisoner Assessment Tool Targeting Estimated Risk and Needs, otherwise known as PATTERN. So between pre-trial and post-conviction, you've got the Bureau of Prisons using a very similar risk assessment instrument. So finally, the systems, at least in terms of risk and needs assessment, are beginning to align. So can you talk a little bit about pattern? Sure. So the First Step Act, which was passed in December of 2018, required the Attorney General to create a risk and needs assessment system for the Bureau of Prisons that would predict recidivism for its for the individuals in their custody. And so uh, we had a very small window in which to actually create the tool. The statute required that the tool included not only dynamic factors, but static as well. The statute was very clear. You have to use a, a lot of things, not just the ones that we know work, but like let's try a lot of stuff out. So we developed Pattern. The Attorney General released it in July of 2019. And then we gave the field and the public an opportunity to speak to, you know, what do you think about this tool? Look, look about what we've done here. What do you what do you think about it? And we actually we took some metrics out because we thought that they might be um, there might be some bias underlining the tool with those particular metrics. And so we now have you know the tool that's been revised based on those particular scores. The BOP will determine based on not just your risk of recidivism, but your needs as well, because they do have their own they have a, a needs assessment process. You know what can we do to help this person be successful when they leave? And we just completed our second validation of the tool. And what we find is that pattern is a predictive um, measure of recidivism. So it's doing very well in terms of distinguishing who's going to and who will not recidivate at the three-year mark. Um, the AUCs are really high and it's it's performing very well when compared to other tools that's that are being used in the field. So we're very proud of the work that's being done. And just like any tool, like any good tool is reviewed and validated and revised as needed. So what's great about the First Step Act is it allows the Attorney General to actually make changes as they see fit. Um, so if, you know, the current Attorney General feels like, you know, I think we need more measures on X, then we can see what we can do about including those and hopefully they, you know, enhance the, the predictive value of, of the tools. And we're really, really excited about it. So before I let you go, I want to give you sort of an open mic. Any thoughts that you'd like to share with practitioners from a researcher's perspective? I think one thing that gets overlooked a lot and I and I hope this addresses the the question 
we don't talk enough about how the officer is engaging with with the actual person. We don't talk about the stress and strain of the job and you know what that looks like for an officer. We are doing research on this because we know from the literature that the relationship between the person being supervised and the person that's doing the supervision is really critical. Like that really enhances their success. You know, it's not the thing that's going to make them successful, but it's definitely one of the factors that helps someone when they're having a bad day or they need help. If they don't trust and have faith in their officer, they may not go to them, but that might be because the officer is overloaded and stressed. That human factor also includes the officer. I think that's something that we don't um, consider enough when we talk about recidivism and reentry because they're important. They're hugely important to this process. One of the questions I, I have, you know, it's really unclear in some ways. What's the temporal order of programming and what matters when, right? So when you have someone who's in custody for five years and they need a GED, they need to get their mental health in order, they need to do a substance abuse program, they need to do CBT and MI, they need to do all of these other things. When do you give those to them? Because we need them to be able to have those skills like fresh and, you know, ready to go and ready to use when they leave so that they're not kind of relearning and like, oh, I forgot that. I took this so long ago. So I think one of the things that one of the challenges for reentry is when you have people who are in prison, especially who are doing more than two years, you know, at what point do you actually give them these services? And do you give them CBT first before you do GED or do you do them together? I mean, what's the order of, of those things and the duration and the frequency and the intensity? So all of these factors really matter and they can really, you know, drive the success of someone when they leave. If they haven't had programming for two years before they've gotten to the gate, then is all of that wasted? You know, how do you how do you make sure that they kind of maintain the skills and the knowledge that they've built while they're in custody with the services that they've been given? The work that is being done in prisons and, you know, in the in the correction space right now is is growing a lot. And I, I think especially with COVID, you know, we're learning a lot about we can move to virtual learning now Um I don't know how prolific that is in the field, but I know for us, like you and myself, Mark, we we, we work from home and we were able to connect in different ways now. So I know that a lot of individuals in prison are kind of learning, okay, I've got to be more tech savvy to be able to get my programs and my services and, and perhaps that will serve them better when they leave. So there's, there's so much work that needs to be done in this space. But I would say to, you know, officers in the field that there's a lot of research out there. There's a lot of resources out there. So especially at NIJ, our our customer is the practitioner. You know, it, it's if the work that we do, the research that we do does not translate to you, then we're not doing our job. So we want to help you. So if you need help, call Marie, call NIJ, let us know, hey, I have a question about this. Can you point me in the right direction? It's incredible work, um, you know, trying to give support to someone who's coming out of custody and and to be that person they can rely on. So we're here to help. So anything that they need, they can come to us anytime. Well, Marie Garcia, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you so much, Mark. Off Paper is produced by Shelley Easter. The program is directed by Craig Bowden. Our program coordinator is Anna Glochkova. Don't forget, folks, you can subscribe to Off Paper on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or pretty much wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Mark Sherman. Thanks for listening. See you next time. This podcast was produced at U.S. taxpayer expense.